It's 11 a.m. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic, a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce Professor Morris, uh, a man who know, needs no introduction to this crowd. Uh, some of the graduate students in the room as well have been reading a lot of your work on economics. We're actually doing economics, uh, economics at ancient Greece today, too. So, uh, most especially, and your greater Athenian state is being read. So, that's in the background. Um, but uh, I, I, I kind of, we had a wonderful introduction last night, everybody was there, so I won't say anything about the 12 books and over 80, 80 articles that you published. Um, I, you know, basically, if it wasn't for Professor Morris, I would not be sitting here in front of you today because... It's all my fault. So, <laughs> somehow, <laughs> somehow, I managed to convince him that I deserve to be a graduate student at Stanford, that, that I could be one of the first, actually, three guinea pigs, yes, that's not called guinea pigs, uh, uh, through this new program in classical archaeology and in the Archaeology Center, which Professor Mars had you know, basically everything to do with it being there and existing at Stanford. Um, and he was the first, well, co-director in 2000 when that began. But, uh, it goes back to 99, actually. Yeah, it's been a long time. Like when you guys uh, arrived at Stanford. You know? Yeah, what should we do with this crowd? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, and uh, basically it's safe to say at this point, I think that many people agree that this is the world's leading ancient story. Um, it, he really uh, is. Now, well, I, I wish my colleagues were here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, said, it's said many times over and over again in various places. But, um, so it's a you know, wonderful pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. And he's also a solid field worker. I had a wonderful time working with him in Sicily. And, you know, never mind the fact that he's only done uh, just, uh, just over a tenth of what Scotty uh, McNeish did in terms of field work. What is that? 5,683 days. Is it you and him? Yeah, so, so if you do the math, do the math, that's that. It is. It's just over 15 and a half years in the field. Yeah. So, but you know, he is a Mesoamerican archaeologist, well known for actually connecting corn to tapes and tape, that kind of thing. And Mesoamerican archaeologists don't really count the number of field days we spend in the Mediterranean and school field days. So, that's a good beach. Exactly. We have too much time on the beach and too, many, too much time in the Vernon. So, uh, but that is, that is very impressive. And so, you know, even though he's a fantastic agent historian, he gets a lot of respect from, you know, he's also an archaeologist. You. Um, but you don't often hear these kinds of things in these kind of introductions. This is a seminar. And I have to say that Professor Morris is a fantastic teacher. Um, he recently won the Dean's Award for Excellence in Graduate Teaching in 2009. And I don't know why we didn't get our act together and put you up for something like that when we were there, but he's justly deserved, justly deserved. Um, he taught me to ask questions of everything you know I do, uh, to always define my terms, always define my terms. Right, that's kind of a, a key one. Never take a statement at face value, um, and uh, to question—I mean, really—to question everything, everything that is, but anything that he has written. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> almost so almost everything. There are certain things you cannot uh, question. So some ground rules for the day. Um, uh, first off, thank you for being here. We really appreciate this. This is this is a rare thing where we've read our authors, we can actually query them and question them about. Um, and uh, so the ground rules are we have the uh, seminar, we have students from the seminar, they'll ask a series of questions that they come up with through reading the, the chapters and various other things, and it's open to everyone else after that uh, who would like to participate. Um, so those of you who are not part of the seminar, you'll have opportunities to ask questions as well as you like. Um, but I'd actually like to, to kick it off, if that's okay. Um, I TA the course back in 2002 for Professor Morris called the Logic of History. Fantastic, fantastic course. Um, and it taught us to kind of dig down into the core questions that a historian might be asking of, um, uh, of, of whatever topic it is they're actually doing their work on. Uh, and uh, how they, not only the core question, but how they arrived at that question. How is it they got there? Um, and one of the great things about having a taller course like that, having a design a course like that, is you have to look no further than the title of the book rather than digging deep into a, into a history book to find a question. Here it is, right here for you. This is the core question of the book. But um, in that class, we also read Jared Jer Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, which we've also read within this class. And um, there have been other comparative 
world histories few the kind of success that this book or Diamonds, Guns, Germs, and Steel uh, have had. And so my, my question really is one that kind of exposed some of the intellectual roots of the book in a way perhaps that we haven't uh, heard before, seen some of the interviews. Um, that has to do with the kind of connection and, and, and influence of Diamond. Uh, in, in Guns, Germs, and Steel, we all, uh, everyone here is intimately familiar with Yali's question, why are we all different? Um, you ask that question in a different way. But there is, within Diamond, these kind of wonderful questions that are there. You know, we ask, why, how is it that the Europeans came to conquer the Inca and not the other way around? Um, and, you know, he also has, uh, you know, his answers. They are immediate rep reasons. Um, and those immediate reasons are military tech, guns, steel, weapons, horses, infectious diseases, uh, endemic to Eurasia. And the question is, um, you know, centralized political organization, all these kind of classic issues, but these are proximal factors. How is it that Europe came to control the proximal factors? And his argument is that, well, there are these ultimate factors that everyone here is really uh, up on this. Um, and so, you know, Diamond, however, and I remember this very well from the class, one of the things, uh, and some folks have actually raised this in the class, uh, so Jason here, he doesn't do very well with China. And I, re I recall that that was something that kind of really uh, had a major influence on me. There's this kind of aberration of what Diamond attempted to do, combined with kind of disappointment for this, for this question of China uh, in that it came out of class. And I was wondering if you just kind of talk a little bit about the influence of Diamond in connection with this book for us. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I love Guns, Jumps, and Steel. And uh, when it came out, it's a long time ago, it came out, 1997, when uh, most of you were probably about five years old or something. A um, long time ago it came out. And at the time, there, there really wasn't anything else quite like this out there. But, uh, if you go back far enough, historians used to take geography very seriously. I kind of wanted to see the father, the history of the fifth century BC, um, maybe geography of the kind of uh, his story. But um, historians are just sort of geography to one side, we didn't really think about it all that much. And historians also, I think because they're the sort of source materials you work with, if you want to be a professional historian, you learn all these languages and you go off to an archive somewhere and you've got some question about uh, at the end of the Seven Years' War or whatever it might be. And you go to some archive in Germany and you read every document in that archive that's relevant to this question, and then a whole bunch more as well. And you learn the German, and you need to learn the Russian, and you need to learn the to a lot of different things that would be allowed to still. You've got to do all these skills, you go to the archives, uh, learning the skills forces you to become narrower and narrower and narrower than what you do. So you've got to get to the bottom of the question. And um, what Diamond, I think the, the, the brilliance of what he did in the country of Steel was to say, well, this is all fine and definitely, this is important to work, everyone should carry on doing that. But a lot of the really interesting big questions can't be answered in that way, right? Zero, we need more detail. You've got to step back and take this very, very long term view of it, so it's a global scale view. And if you're going to do that, you can't use the sort of techniques that historians have traditionally used. You've got to look at the archaeology and the linguistics and all these different things. And just start thinking about problems in an entirely different way. And a lot of what he said in Guns, Jones and Steel, and the individual bits, were not really news to the people who were specialists in these fields. Like, so it's what he's saying about the end of the Ice Age and the beginning of agriculture. Um, you know, most archaeologists who've worked on the beginnings of agriculture would say, well, yeah, I think we sort of knew this already. You heard that a lot from people who were working on it. We knew this already. But nobody really put together in this package and said that so much about the shape of the world we live is driven by what happened 15,000 years ago. And, um, and for me, the, the, it was a sort of eye opening book. I've been doing, um, you know, all this work in Greek archaeology, expansion of Greeks across the Mediterranean basin. Economic growth in the ancient world. And it, uh, I mean, it did a lot of stuff in archaeology and it was interesting in a lot of different parts of the world, but it never occurred to me that you could actually pull it together in quite that sort of way. And I think it's a, a revolution in, book in, in that kind of sense. But you know, having said that, you're know, like any book, uh, any good book, if you're addressing a particular question, um, and if you then try to um, to stretch it out to answer other questions. It doesn't always perform so well, uh, answering things it wasn't designed to do. And I guess I would say, Guns, Jones, and Steel, that's really about the sort of north-south contrast in the world. And why is the northern hemisphere kind of taken over the show? And uh, I think they did a spectacular job of identifying the root causes of that. So, um, what happened uh, 15,000 years ago, where agriculture began, that was what determined the northern hemisphere. 
hemisphere now is the most advanced in the world. And then why can't the southern hemisphere, like Yali, the Catholic CDN, so that they want to be in the city of the When he got to ask you about differences within the northern hemisphere, that, I think, only like you saying, but the challenge is. That's where it sort of broke down a little bit, because the tools he was using were too coarse grains for that kind of analysis. They were superb, the question he asked, less good for that particular kind of comparison. Um, and so, yeah, I, mean, I, I also put he did a less good job with that. But that really wasn't really saying what to do with So, yeah, I, I just think it's what my gumption is in, one of the best books I've ever read in the world. And um, in the last few years, I've, I've gotten to know Jeremy a little bit. And he's just one of the nicest guys you can imagine. And a lot of famous people are really horrible. <laughs> and he's, he's, he's just a really, really good which is nice. <laughs> and your National Geographic series will follow soon as well. <laughs> so let's open it up to questions. Please, who wants to go first? Don't be shy. Tally, you use both. Well, um, I'll, 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 Catherine, please. Um, so my question is more based off of your lecture from last night. Uh, you were talking about geography and how it's just a huge thing in the entire book that you wrote. And I, my question is, when you were talking about how eventually it's going to, the lines of east versus west are going to become incredibly blurred mm -hmm. to the point where it doesn't exist. My question more is, do you think that country borders and those lines are going to become blurred as well? And mm -hmm. do you think that's going to eventually happen by 2103 or before that? Yes. Yeah, good, great question. I, I, I think one of the one of the big difficulties we've got as we go into the 21st century is that um, the most powerful and effective institutions in the world are, are basically nation states. You know, creations within the late 18th, early 19th century in Europe um, that begin to spread out generally across the whole planet. And these are, uh, they've been phenomenally successful organizations. You know, people haven't started to organize governments and societies along this sort of way. You know, a lot of the, the, the economic Progress and success of humanity in the last two centuries would even have been a lot slower and wouldn't have been able to happen at all. So they are fantastic organizations. Um, the problem is they are really good at solving issues and things within their own political borders. And uh, within, a, within its own borders, the governments can set rules about most things and control an awful lot of what's going on and channel it in directions they want to see it going. Or, uh, depending on what's going on, the government can step back and allow a group of people within their borders to do what they want to do. Nation states are way less effective at dealing with global scale problems. And again, this is so obvious, I guess. Um, and so many of the problems, as the world gets more time to integrate, so many of the problems I think are, are operating on global scale. And so you know, nation states have struggled to deal with uh, something like global terrorism. It's just very difficult to, to get together and, and really get a hold of it. Um, and climate change, I guess, would be the, the classic example of this. So, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, when they had the big climate in Copenhagen, the beginning of 2000, to the end of 2000, something like that. And they had the big climate in Copenhagen. And there's a lot of excitement about you know, maybe uh, governments are going to be able to come up with some kind of pattern organization that will really make it not only possible, but actually attractive for people to start doing something to reduce climate. And on the whole, I think the, the people who went to Copenhagen um, went there with good intentions. They, they wanted to produce binary beings that would have positive results, but they couldn't do it. And I think that they failed in not because of the evil, wicked people scheming to gain the system. They failed just because it was so difficult to um, get the interests of the nation state governments and aligned with global scale problems. Um, and I think this is the big challenge within the 21st century. The more and more of our problems are operating at the level, the governmental institutions we've got are not ideally designed to tackle these sorts of problems. And so either we're going to do a terrible job at tackling them, or like people did 200 years ago, we're going to have to come up with new institutions that work better to do this. And you know, like, like I said last night, I'm guardedly optimistic that people will manage to do this. And you know, we have seen the progress of the last 20, 30 years. Of so, yeah, I, I, I think we will get there. I, I think um, it's going to involve the sort of thing you were talking about in the question, of a, at least a blurring of the nation state borders. And uh, this, I think, you like a lot of the other stuff. 
I suspect will happen in the 21st century. It's something, of course, we can already see in this house. Organizations like the UN, the European Union, these are supranational ones, um, that, that they have their limitations. But they've done a lot of tremendous stuff. And then at the same time, these sort of subnational organizations, NGOs and stuff, are doing things that 50 or 100 years ago nobody would have thought that uh, volunteer organizations would be able to do all these things that used to be the uh, other components. So, I, I, yeah, I do think this is the direction. Chris puts you on the spot. Oh, it's going to have you. 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 One thing I really liked in chapter three when you made that analogy about what you're doing is cheese bar. I really, really liked that because it just helped me understand like this is really broad. And so I really did like that. But in there, um, when you pick out your four traits, um, mm -hmm. it said like, you know, you had kind of toyed with some um, different traits that really didn't matter. Yeah. It was the amount of difference really would affect the raw score. I was just kind of wondering what were some of those other traits you were playing out? Yeah, some of them were ones that seemed like a really good idea, but then just turned out to be like way too difficult to, to use in practice. Um, like say, gosh, what happened? Well, one of the things I thought, that maybe it would be good to have some direct measure of kind of um, like transport capacity. Because yeah, this is kind of a big stuff that we're going to do stuff around. So maybe it'd be good to have some kind of direct measure of uh, the speed and extent of transportation networks. And I think that it's something that, in general terms, you can say, well, yeah, we, we clearly see this acceleration in this size and speed and effectiveness of these transportation systems. But actually getting down to the level of detail where I can produce the numbers I need to my index, I just couldn't do it. So it just couldn't, I couldn't make it work. And then there were other things like, um, I mean, I sort of toyed a little bit in the beginning with, well, maybe there is some way to quantify uh, the, the, the power of intellectual systems. Like, because this is one of the big arguments that people have uh, over Western civilization and the decline and what's being done. And so some people say, well, there's just, there's something better about the philosophical intellectual system than the end of the world and the systems in other places. And so if there was some way to measure that satisfactorily, that would that could be a really interesting thing. But um, I found that like, I just couldn't make it work. That everything that I was doing to make it work, I realized in the end this was like so riddled with kind of culture bound assumptions. So um, I, I got a friend, I, I co-wrote a book with this guy, Barry Powell. Do you ever meet that thing? I, really like I remember Barry from a wonderful <laughs> talk in Stanford yes, uh, with yes. Richard Martin at the other end of the table. And I'll, I'll Barry, he's an extraordinary guy. Um, he's one of the loudest classicists in the world. And he comes together to talk. You are, it seems you will be pinned against the back wall. Okay? Just incredible volume and energy. Just really like the guy. But one of Barry's things is that um, the alphabet that we've seen in 700 BC is a qualitatively better medium for writing than any other script system that we invented before that. And uh, it's, it's, it's simply it's like the perfect system. For recording speech in writing. And um, you know, if that's true, and obviously this is, this is really important, and um, I, mean, I, I don't know if it's true or not, I mean, it's come through a lot of attack from linguists who point out that yeah, it's a very good system for recording most of the European languages, but a lot of other language systems, in fact, alphabetic scripts are not necessarily the best way. I mean, I don't know enough about linguistics to know what the answers are here. But um, you're know, thinking about that. Uh, I just couldn't think of any way that you could actually measure um, the success of, say, a, a, a writing system or a philosophical system or, or a religious system or anything else you would choose to do. I just couldn't. How, how can you do this without just importing your own cultural biases into it? So that's how I ended up with the four that I got. They were the four that worked least badly, I would say. They, they, they worked badly, but they're not as badly as a lot of people. And yeah, I mean, I think you, you mentioned this in your question too, though. Uh, um, the, the sense I've got of tinkering around with different things, and in fact, there's just an awful lot of redundancy going on here. And um, the ones, the traits that I thought we could look at, well, we can't score to the level of detail that I need to do with the index, but you get a vague sense of what's going on. I think they all come out looking rather similar. But you know, the, the point, of course, is that if somebody else disagrees, if they're able to come up with a different set of traits that 
it seems to be equally relevant to the idea of social development. The producer's a totally different graph. Then obviously I'm wrong. Uh, but that can be a It's a great question, Tom. And there's an article that Professor Morris wrote in 2009 called Cultural Complexity, which is a term that he didn't use. He used social development. Um, cultural complexity is something rarely well defined in archaeology. But there have been so many attempts to try to do this, going back to people like people and child. Yeah, but actually, I mean, that's a, 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 an important point to, to bear in mind. When, when somebody writes a book like this one that I did, um, very, very little of what goes in these books is actually original, in the sense that nobody's had been reviews before. This is something a hundred plus years of modern scholarship. <coughs> Anything you could ever want to do research on, you, you're going to find once you start doing anything, there are dozens of people devoted dozens of years of their lives to investing the same time. I'll tell you, the good news is that all the hard work is usually done for you already. It's just about looking, bolting these things together in a new way. The bad news is, usually if you do have a completely original idea that nobody's had before, that usually means it's a really bad idea. <laughs> 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 it's a really bad idea that nobody has thought of this before. So I was going to ask you, sir, about, uh, in chapter 7, you discussed where both the Romans and the, the Chinese were conflicted with the outsider, the outsider forces coming because of the bad decisions that were made within the policies that these empires instituted in that civilization. And I was wondering if you could, yeah, just looking at the financial problems today and looking at what they went through then, um, is it a plausibility to say there's a parallel between what they went through and like the, like the uh, Caliph al-Mahum, he conscripted three months of Turks and brought them in when he actually became their slave. Yeah, it seemed, seemed like a good idea at the time that it did, yeah. right? And I was wondering if, if, if there's a certain parallel throughout history where they do bring in outsiders, those who are in power, and they do fall to their own. I was just wondering if with the current financial climate right now, if there are other nations, maybe in the foreseeable future, who could take the same stance that we have seen in the patterns in the U.S. Mm, gosh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, because I think, um, as you say, this, this has been a recurrent pattern. Um, people are confronted with a problem, uh, and, you know, not just problems where they try to solve by bringing it out of but you regularly get confronted by a problem, uh, you find what looks like a solution to that problem, only to find that uh, your solution down the road has, produces even worse problems than you thought before. And I, mean, I guess the classic example in recent history that people uh, regularly talk about is yeah, in um, end of 1979, the Soviet Union decides it's infinite wisdom, it's going to invade Afghanistan. So they go into Afghanistan. Um, uh, some US politicians decided that their infinite wisdom, the best way, here's the thing that's probably got less than the Soviet Union, the best thing possibly doing here is turn Afghanistan into their Vietnam. So we, we don't even have to spend that much money, but we're going to arm some of these uh, insurgent groups fighting the Soviet Union. Seems like a great idea at the time. Um, not maybe handled as well as it could have been handled. The end result, yes, we give the Soviets this terrible time in Afghanistan. It clearly <coughs> plays at least a part in the unraveling the Soviet Union by 1985. But the result, of course, is you just leave Afghanistan this horrible mess. It ends up being a place where some of the Laden's had set in space with some very serious consequences for the US down the road. And uh, it, this is the sort of pattern that's just happened so many times in the past by the Romans really in uh, dealing with the problem of large groups of Germanic people trying to move across the border by letting some of them come in and then hiring the guys they let in to fight against the other guys to stop them. The, uh, they do it again some centuries later with the Arabs on the Arab frontier, the result of the Arabs and they're taking over the whole thing and the Byzantine Empire. The, the Chinese do it with the Turkic groups like the all the time. Uh, these sort of solutions um, regularly produce much bigger problems than they originally decided to solve. But I think that there, there is another side to it, though. So we tend to concentrate on the times when things go so badly because these sort of paradoxical outcomes are just kind of weird and interesting. And there's a lot of times when it doesn't go badly, which we tend not to do. It actually works out pretty well. And even the times when it goes badly, often it goes well for centuries um, until it doesn't go well anymore. Like the Romans with the Germans, they start bringing in. Germans in a small scale uh, as early as the first century AD. Uh, when the Romans conquered Britain, uh, the bulk of the troops who do the fighting for the Romans are actually Germans. And this goes 
wealth for like maybe 400 years. Well, it, it goes okay for like 400 years. That's a long time. You know, maybe twice as long as the United States has existed. So, uh, um, yeah, you, don't, you just don't know how these things are going to turn out. Um, I just have a broad question. When you're approaching a global history book and uh, ideas, you know, like why the West rules for now, um, how important are questions like what if and uh, but if, things like that? Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm thinking of a specific example of uh, the Battle of Salamis, where, like, what if Darius had caught my feet in the Greeks? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I guess there's an idea of, you know, is, is some of why the West rules, is it luck or are there? I guess how do you ask those questions? Yeah, yeah, uh, great question. Because this is a, a question that um, professional historians always never ask themselves. It, it's right, really uh, considered a sign that there's something wrong with you if you go around that, talking about the one in questions. Because you know, most people interested in history who are not professional academic historians tend to find the one in questions the most interesting bits about it. There are tons of TV shows on the History Channel. And, you know, why Hitler had never been born, it's going to be their favorite show topics at the time. So this is something that a lot of people are interested in, but historic, professional historians tend to shy away from it, which I think is a huge mistake. Um, this is only the, the title of uh, my book, Why the West World. It seems to me that any time you ask a why question, ask about causation, uh, ask about causes, the only way you can assess that is by asking the why the question. So say, why did when it, when it's, I guess, say you've got some theory about the outbreak of World War II, and your theory says it, it's all Adolf Hitler's fault. You know, none of the other variables that people talk about have nothing to do here. It was all about it, but Hitler was entirely, entirely to blame for it. The, the obvious implication of what you're saying is that if Hitler hadn't existed, World War II would not have happened. Um, you can only make that claim in a serious way if you have some way to talk about a world without it. Got some reason to be able to, to sketch out what would have happened. And I think that the big problem that historians have talking about causes of things is that on the whole they tend to be unwilling to make the what if thing explicit. And they're still doing that implicitly. They are imagining the world without Hitler and coming to the conclusion of what the world is But the minute you start making it explicit, say, okay, I am required by logic to think about what the world is like without Hitler. Um, the, the great thing is that then that makes you start getting a lot more serious about what you're doing. Saying, okay, Hitler's gone. Well, what do I mean by Hitler's gone? Do I mean Hitler doesn't get bored? Or do I mean Hitler doesn't become chancellor? What exactly do I mean? You have to start getting a lot more precise about this. You have to start thinking about, well, depending on the different scenarios we're now playing out, no Hitler at all, <coughs> Hitler dying in the First World War, Hitler not being a chancellor, and so on. What second order consequences? flow from that first order of change. And people who are non-historians have just been much, much better than this. And economists are particularly about that. So this is kind of what they do. They think about what the consequences are of different economic actions. There's a fantastic um, book written by a guy named Robert Fogel who went on to win the Nobel Prize back in the His first big hit was back in the early 1960s. He wrote this book called uh, Railroads and American Economic Growth. It's a kind of tedious time. Uh, but his question he's saying is, uh, back then, 50 years ago, this George would often say it's the railroad that makes the American economy. The you know, place like Texas were right? brought into the American economy by the railroad. If it hadn't been for the steam technology, America would never have become American. And Fogel says, well, okay, uh, maybe that's true, but maybe it's not true. Let's examine it. And in that case, we got reams of economic data from the 19th century US. So uh, he was able to calculate reasonably plausibly um, a formula for expressing the input of uh, the railways into the US economy. And it's pretty spectacular. They really drove the growth in a major way. Okay, so it's not Let's subtract um, the, the railways from the economy. What happens? Much, much slower economic growth. Very different from America. Okay, so it's not What would what have happened, though, if for some reason steam technology just doesn't get Deeply unlikely, it's impossible to how it could not be infected. But so what if it didn't get infected? Because that is really what he's thinking about. What would have happened to all the investment that was put into railroads? Because now there are no railroads. So now you've got all this capital washing around, all these people still interested in um, moving goods from A to B, 
What if they invested that money in refrigeration? I believe they do invest in refrigeration, but it comes a lot more to practical application. What if they invested in the internal combustion engine? And it was at this point the book starts becoming necessarily more speculative, but he's still able to produce vaguely believable estimates of how much faster innovation would run in these fields if they had railroad. And he ends up coming to the conclusion that, in fact, the railroad was not the driver of the economic growth. Even if it never existed, the US economy would have expanded almost as fast because of all the second order things that were going on. Um, but of course, that's a really special case because we've got all this quantifiable material that you could work with. You know, when you talk about the fall of the Roman Empire and stuff, you are sort of reduced to making it up. But I think you can, sort of, you can make it up with it controllable. And I think the great problem for historians is that if you, the minute you ask the why question, you've got to do this kind of what you're thinking. There's other fun. Is it, is it just too much work, or is it too speculative, or is it, I guess, a combination of both? Yeah, I think um, the, the speculative thing is what people will talk about most, I mean, it's not to do. And it kind of got a, a bad reputation. There was a, a time, particularly in the early 20th century, when historians were a lot more prone to the why speculating stuff. And of course all this all these speculations turn out to be you know, embarrassingly wrong all the time, because that's the way it is. Um, so it, it got kind of a bad name. Now people like people who do this, uh, people people like me, um, tend to get very much frowned on by their colleagues for being silly and doing this. Um, and I, I, I begin the book with a made up story about the Chinese taking over the world in the nineteenth century. Uh, and a lot of historians say, well that's that's just silly. But I, I do think that you're writing the kind of book that I wrote, that is what you're doing. You are imagining the possibilities of other worlds coming out. And you just don't, you could just go try to take it a bit more seriously. The students in the class really enjoyed the counterfactual. Right? I mean, that was okay. well, yeah. <laughs> the best mission of the book. It's all downhill after that patient report. That's good. Uh, do you have a question to follow up on? There, like, doesn't that help though? Like, the idea of like, looking at the possibility, looking at these different patterns that occur in history that you can possibly forecast with these possibilities through these lenses. I mean, did that help you do that a little bit in the book? That's what I presume in some of your chapters it did help you kind of focus in and say, hey, well, this is a possibility, and we have to ask this question. Can you expound a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, the, the, the conclusion I kind of came to about doing this is that you're juggling two balls all the time. One is you're looking at the trend lines, these big things playing out over millennia, and that's something I think that we can see about the way the trends are going in the future time. And so you could say, like say, um, for me one of the best examples is Muhammad. You know, Muhammad, if ever there's a, a great man in history, someone who his individual actions change the way things are going, at this time, Muhammad is pretty near the top of the list. Uh, and yet, the big stuff that happens in the centuries after Muhammad starts preaching Islam, a lot of the stuff is only going before he shows up. Like, you know, the breakdown of the Persian of this being empires, this is far advanced before the Arabs show up. Um, the shift in wealth and power, the sort of center of that toward East Asia, this is already very far advanced before he shows up. Um, and so I think you can plausibly argue, at least I, I mean, that if they didn't know Muhammad, things obviously would have been different. You wouldn't have had Islam in the form that you get. You might have had, I mean, you, you would have had other desert prophets popping up, because there were dozens of them at this time. But, you know, very good chance none of them would have uh, energized people the way Muhammad did. You, very good chance you wouldn't have got the Arab conquests. Um, and so the world, of course, would have been really different from all kinds of ways. And you, you wouldn't now have this huge area of Islam from the North Africa all the way out to Indonesia. But a lot of stuff would have turned out rather similar. Um, you wouldn't have the breakdown of the big empires in the West, declining social development going on there for centuries, the rise of big empires in the East, rising social development there for several centuries. Um, the, the sort of geographical forces that I focus on would have sort of played out in the same kind of way. So I, I think what you have to focus on all the time is the, the interaction between the big trends that we see going on in the history and then the ability of whatever the thing is you're looking at, whether it's an individual or a particular idea or religion or culture, whatever it is, how plausible is it that some changes in this factor could disrupt the big trend that happens? Because obviously there are things that could do that. I mean, one of the examples I focus on to the end of the book is the Cuban Missile Crisis, where 
that, by that point, by 1962, you've got individuals whose decisions really can change the whole history. You have John Kennedy have been a complete hothead and pressed the button, signed the bomb on the basis of Cuba. Um, things would be really, really different. But through most of history, I think uh, you know, great men and great women, I'm actually imagine as great women, they like to think they are. <laughs> uh, that, uh, it's the decisions of millions and millions of people that are real factors. And those are the ones that tend to be driven by these kind of statistical patterns and probabilities of the material forces. Yeah, that, another, another good question, you know, how, how these sorts of things are going to play out. Um, this, is, this is two big theories about this. There's one that says that as countries um, become richer, and become you know, more industrialized, and people, you know, fewer people work in the land, more people live in cities, um, more prosperous, as that happens, the countries become more westernized. That uh, they will inevitably move, to, to make this happen, they will inevitably move toward more liberal uh, sort of, uh, the 19th century sense of liberal, more liberal political institutions, more freedom, more responsiveness of governments to the people through democratic institutions. And that in uh, this argument holds that basically modernization and westernization are the same thing. So as East Asia becomes richer, it becomes more like the West. The other thing is you look at history and um, in pretty much every case, the richest and most powerful groups are the ones whose values are adopted by the people now. And according to that theory, if wealth and power continues to shift toward East Asia, we're not going to see East Asia become westernized, we're going to see the rest of the world become Easternized. So it's two very different theories about um, where the world might be going culturally. And I, mean, I tend to suspect that most of these sorts of things, the answer ends up being somewhere in the middle. Um, and this one, I, I guess I, mean, I, I do think that people are right to say that uh, the, the sort of modern capitalist economy that's driven so much of humanity's success in this last couple of hundred years, this works better in more, with more open institutions. And that it's really difficult to do this with a tightly controlled and centralized society. And um, I mean, perhaps not impossible to do it. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe China can make this work. But I, mean, I think the evidence so far from East Asia, clearly a lot of East Asian societies have moved to the world. Like you look at South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, uh, you know, 50 years ago, these were pretty nasty one of these states, and these were not nice governments there at all. And now, I mean, yeah, they've got their problems still, clearly, but <clears throat> they've all become, you know, more or less become democracies, uh, where there's you know, more or less freedom of speech and movement and so on. And even in China, there's been some movement in this direction. So I think that there is some grounds for optimism that China is going to become uh, more, a bit more like the United States. But I, I guess I do think that that's no guarantee that that means that that's the whole story. I think it's quite possible that um, it may be the way a lot of East Asians actually claim that what they've done is invent this sort of compromise between very centralized government and a more Western style open ways of doing things. And that the world is going to end up looking really more well like nature. But yeah, I mean, who knows about that? Who knows? Um, I have a similar question. Um, I think you mentioned that there's a lot of Yeah, I, I do think the South, um, South is already starting to get its turn. And, uh, and one of the things that people don't often realize is the world's fastest growing large group of economies is Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, everybody is, uh, when you 
because we've got the time plans to take care of, which you probably don't have to worry about just yet. But you were constantly being urged of where you should be putting your money in that. Uh, there's all these things about it. Extraordinary changes. Um, and I think you know, what, what we're seeing is um, the world, as the world gets drawn together more and more, uh, parts of the world uh, that have previously been, previously been somewhat out of the main flow of things have been drawn into it. And often, this is a very, very traumatic experience. So this, I think, is the, one of the lessons in history that we can see. Being drawn into an economic system dominated by somebody else is rarely much fun. It usually involves a lot of violence. It usually involves other people devastating your homelands, which, of course, has been Africa's experience in the last couple of years. But um, over the long run, uh, over the 500 years plus, often people end up much better off as a result of yeah, this is what happened uh, to, to uh, East Asia, that's what's drawn into the American government, you can't more dramatic experience. Now there's even spectacular amounts of them. This, I think, is, we can always see it happening in Africa. I mean, maybe I'm a little optimistic here, but I think the worst, I, I think the worst is that it's generally not going to be improved. And of course, South America is another place where we should expect to see major But I mean, like I was saying in the lecture last night, I, I do also think that the rate of change is now moving so fast that probably the, the world will change had more recognition before Africa actually catches up. Uh, so, so you mentioned that Africa is a And so you know, what I ended up doing, I ended up you know, focusing on these two regions of the world because I'm um, focusing on you know, quick, rough estimates of the numbers. These appear to be the two regions that throughout history that the most developed part of the world have always been one of these two regions. So uh, to, to, to make things possible, this is possible, it's now we have the two regions. But Steve and I were talking about this yesterday and this morning, and we were to learn now. But, uh, I, I think it was this morning, uh, you, were, you were talking about India. Because uh, um, when I started writing the book, uh, I had, I was originally doing it as a three-cornered stool of the two of these. And so it's going to be East Asia, South Asia, and then Western Europe, which is my lead up, the zones and the problems are. Um, which I think the basic story would have come out pretty much the same. But the story would be much more complicated. You know, inevitably, the more <coughs> variables you put into your pot, the more complicated it gets. And in the book, if I'd, written, if I'd ended up writing the book in the same way that I did, I did the book wouldn't have been 50% longer than I had in the case. It would have been at least twice as long. And there's a good multiplication on some addition as you add extra regions to the world. Also. But yeah, what a woman piece, yeah. Because it's sort of rather depressing when somebody says something like this. And the book's half as long as War and Peace. Do you get 50% of the back of your book by reading my book as against War and Peace? When you put it that way, of course, it's rather difficult to think I should recommend that people read my book rather than the first half of War and Peace. I wish you hadn't said that. But yeah, so anyway, so I had thought about doing it that way. I realized after about two chapters in that I was going to have to face a choice. Yeah, either I um, would have to drop India from my story, just do a two way comparison to, to make the book manageable possible. Or I'm going to have to tell the story in an entirely different way. Because there are, you know, a lot of what goes on in the, the book, and one of the tensions running through it is this uh, issue of, you know, is it really the vast economic forces, or is it really the action, the conscious actions of human individual agents that drive the story along? And I thought that the only way to make my case about the vast personal forces was by looking at a lot of these decisions, so like when the Chinese abandoned all these technologies in the end. And you're going into it and saying, well, what actually happens here? And then showing uh, that why it is, I think, that the, the, the vast and personal forces of the world. So there's a lot in the book about what the individuals do the same thing and so on. 
And if I'd had the Indian case in there as well, I kind of done that. Uh, the book would have had to be much higher, uh, sort of analytically everything out. And so I agonized over it for quite a long time and decided, you know, both of my options were bad, but the way I did it, I felt it the less bad of the two options. So I'd still love to come back to this, uh, but I don't know anywhere near enough about India. It's hard enough learning about Chinese history to learn all the Indian history and the, the sort of required level of detail. Yeah, what are you bashing? <laughs> I'll come in just to follow up on that for a reason too, because this is this is a great publication, um, and uh, uh, you know standard academic publications. That question of trade versus pub uh, publication versus standard academic publication does that kind of impact this question about how it is written that way as well, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And I'm thinking as well of some of the you know every. <clears throat> Every state in itself is a huge black box, and it's very difficult to kind of skirt over things like talking about, for example, uh, Jews in, in Egypt, and the question that takes us and what we're actually talking about, the debates around that are huge. Yeah. And it's easily, so how is it that you made the decision to kind of um, kind of go through that? Because they are like, you know, um, they're very thorny. It's a thorny ambush. Everywhere you put your foot when you're talking about these things, you have to pick a sentence that allows you to move through it, right? Um, do you identify the Jews with let's say, you know, the slaves in, in Egypt, or do you identify them the way that Josephus and others who picked up on that uh, have uh, reading with Menethio, that they are associated with kind of the Hyksos. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, some of the Egyptologists do back that up as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, if, when, when you're writing something kind of uh, to the biggest sort of scale, basically every sentence you write, um, you can find, uh, hopefully, at least one highly re reputable academic uh, who has said similar things in his or her work to back up what you're saying. But you can usually find a larger number of equally level academics to say the exact opposite. And this is true in virtually every sentence in the book. It's sort of overwhelming. Um, which, of course, presents you with a big problem. I mean, like, uh, you guys taking your classes in Texas Tech, you're basically being taught to approach problems in an academic analytic kind of way. I mean, you're given a, a paper to write, a topic to write people on, whatever, and you're given some material to work with. And, you know, obviously there's always more material, there's no end to the you can go to. But you, you know, within the constraints of time you've got there, you want us to wrestle with this stuff and, and deal with it like an academic work. So you provide lots of references in your footnotes and explain your argument in lots and lots of detail. And uh, yeah, if you go on into academic careers, so this is what you'll do, but on a much bigger scale, you'll go to the archives and you'll learn everything there is to know about the problem you're dealing with. And you'll like books that have the footnotes are longer than the text of the book, and you'll explain all, for every single possible alternative construal you can find this text, and why you come to this one rather than all of those others. And, and this is the way professional stories work, and this is a really good thing. This is what makes academic history today different from what we were in 500 years ago. This is why um, there are at least tenuous claims to say that feel like history is a science, because we develop rigorous methods of analysis. And so you know, history consists of all these people doing all that stuff, and if they stop doing it, the whole exercise just becomes handful of being making stuff up. But the problem, um, that's great if you're asking a really detailed historical you. If you're asking you know, how many tanks did the Germans have for battle of Kursk in 1943, that's the way one assumes. Anybody who doesn't approach it that way is just a time waster. If you're asking a question like the, the sort of thing that Jared Diamond raises, or the stuff I'm using this book, you can't work this way. If your subject matter is like the whole plant to cost 15,000 years, you cannot read every document in every archive in the world and solve every archaeological excavation on the done. Um, it's just insane to think you can. So you've got, to, <clears throat> you've got to back up, you've got to step back from it, and work at, you know, frankly, a much more superficial level. And you start having to do the thing which is the ultimate sin in, uh, in academic scholarship, which is to rely on the secondary literature. So you don't consult the evidence yourself. You consult what some great professor has said about it. And you find very quickly, of course, that all professors disagree. So you end up making your choices among these professors without really knowing what the evidence is. And either you do that, which is superficial and shoddy scholarship, or you stop asking big questions. So it, it is a difficult thing to do, and for somebody you know, like me, like, like Chris, like Steve, who trained as an academic professional, it's very painful to, 
to let go of the detail and step back to it. I'm just going to say what I think happened. And you can have, like, like I do, it's a bit of a graph, but I'll say at the end, I can point people towards some of the other alternative theories. But even there, you can only begin to scratch the surface. And so you know that when you look at colleagues, especially as colleagues, pick this book and start reading it, every sentence they're going to be, oh, no, no, no. And the best you can hope for is to write it in a way which kind of signals to the experts that you are aware of all the problem difficulties, without becoming so tedious that um, the non-expert readers just say, oh, my God, you know, five pages this and sit to death with the just too dry. And uh, so this, this was the first time I attempted to do that. And it, was, it was a really interesting sort of craftsmanship challenge for how you do this. So I had a lot of fun very different than the other ones I've ever with immensely tedious books. Uh, and this one I hope is a little less tedious than the other ones. So I, I will start calling on folks so this can answer <laughs> itself, but I'm actually going to go talk. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, if you discussed too, uh, when you were discussing the theory, was that the not fall through versus the seeming uh -huh. theory? Yes. And I, I know that you do see them both probable, but I didn't know if you favored one over the other, if you saw one more likely. Yeah, I guess I mean I do lean toward the singularity type of argument. That seems to me, uh, I mean, without any terribly good reasons for saying so, I mean, it does seem to be a more plausible argument. I think that one of the things to be sort of cheerful and optimistic about is how successful uh, humans have been uh, in adapting their institutions and value to the kind of ways we were talking about earlier, so to be able to confront reality and face the problems that they face, so even when the problems are very unpleasant. And it's not an easy thing to do. There's always these missteps along the way. And um, I mean, like me, if you, if, you, if you follow what's going on in US politics today, there's an awful lot of missteps along the way. Uh, but often, I think, um, it's not that difficult to figure out what needs to be done. It's just it's difficult to get there and do what needs to be done. Because there's so many different interest groups and so many costs to pay for doing the thing we need to and so, I mean, I'm reasonably optimistic that we will stumble our way to more, and not, you know, probably not perfect solutions, but to, to good enough solutions, which I think is, is the thing that humans have been pretty good at. And um, uh, again, Steve Balch and I were talking about this just a few minutes ago before we came in here. And um, I was saying that it had been um, doing all this 50 years ago, back in 1963, shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, 18 months or so. Uh, uh, the big Berlin crisis, where again it looked very possible that there was going to be a major nuclear war going on. And if I had said to you guys, yeah, the world is divided between the US and the Soviet spheres, they're both armed to the teeth, the Americans have already got enough nuclear weapons to kill a billion people, the Soviets don't, but within a decade they will. Um, if this comes on, there'll be enough weapons to kill everybody on the planet. But don't worry, it's all going to be fine. Because you know what's going to happen is one day the Russians are all going to wake up and say, this communism thing just doesn't work for me. I don't like it anymore. We're going to stop it now. It's stupid. We're going to stop it. And um, there's going to be some unhappiness, and a couple of hundred Romanians are going to get shot. But we are not going to have a billion dead in one day of war. The Soviet Union will disappear. They will vote themselves out of existence. Russia will withdraw from the Soviet Union and it will collapse. And this is all going to happen. And it's all going to be fine. And it's going to be a bumpy ride and traumatic. It's all going to be fine. Um, warfare will decline dramatically. The population of the world will be living longer, be richer than ever before. It's all going to be great. You would have all looked at me like I'd just fallen off the moon or something. This would be so ridiculous. And yet, of course, that is basically the way it turns out. And I think mean, it's not an accident. Uh, I think you know, we now know enough about the Cold War to be able to see that the chances of it actually going nuclear, except by accident, were always really, really low. Uh, the institutions that people develop, especially after the Cuban Crisis, make it highly unlikely that it's ever going to go seriously nuclear. Um, and once that's off the table, uh, the, the, the US at the end of the Second World War came up with this strategy of containment, to avoid fighting, to take this over the world. Absolutely brilliant strategy. And once you get to a point where you're not going to have a nuclear war, gradually that strategy is going to um, I mean, you know, now, it's easy to say now, it wasn't so obvious at the time, having lived in the cold war, it was not obvious at the time. With retrospect, it was always overwhelmingly likely that the United States was going to win the cold war, and that 
Soviet system is going to break down. Um, because the institutions do evolve, people adapt to the world around them. And I think that is the great example of why I'm reasonably optimistic that the things will all kind of work out in the next century or century. Um, if you think that fusing with a computer is the best outcome. Not everybody agrees, but my wife thinks it'd be much better if we just had a nuclear war. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the book the same way I went to almost everything, which is without thinking it through very carefully before I started. I think I wouldn't start by reading things if I actually thought I was going to be involved in it. So yeah, the geography, it really did come to me as I was writing the book. And, and it wasn't until I got to chapter 8, so it was 12 chapters, I got to chapter 8, before I suddenly said, oh my god, the book is about geography. I had not realized this. <laughs> and and the, um, I mean, it just sounds ridiculous. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that's often, it's difficult for people to realize this, and unless you've done quite a lot of writing, is that almost all of us, I think, when we start off working on a problem, thinking about it, I think it is incredibly important. And I think there's very few people, I mean, there are people, but there are very few aren't there, who are able to just, I mean, sort of crisply and analytically within their own mind to hone the whole thing down, to get down to what is it we're really trying to say. I think mean, most people tend to be much more like me. You sort of muddle along, bouncing around. I mean, I wrote out this proposal for the book, and the argument, in a lot of ways, was broadly like the argument I make in the book. But uh, I, I haven't seen that what my whole thing really boiled down to was the geographical fact when I started the book. And um, it wasn't until I got to chapter 8, which is, uh, what is it? That's like 1150, chapter 8, that I, I realized that, you know, these. Arguments I've been making about um, the origins of agriculture, the fall of the great empires, why it is that after 500 AD you see uh, development rising higher in East Asia than it is in the Western Eurasia. All of these arguments actually come down to the same thing. And I just haven't realized it. I've been, like, it was all too muddy in my mind. And I was thinking it's, it's sort of about economics, and it is sort of about economics. But I was in fact saying that the geographical forces are what drive these economics. And um, chapter eight was a very late stage in the day to be having this realization. Because it really meant I go back to the beginning and start the whole down the memory. Not not from scratch, but every chapter had to be rewritten fairly substantially once I grasped what it was about. Um, but because it was good and I did, if I had carried on up to the end, it would have, would have been a, a very muddled, very confused book, which I think is the way most academic books are. Um, through a combination of people not pushing themselves hard enough to say, well, what am I actually talking about here? Um, or if they do, then people may be not willing to confront the work of redoing the whole thing from the beginning. So it is sort of daunting. And I mean, hopefully it'll be one of the things I'm sure you're learning as a student trying to pay for yourself and think this is classic. It is the value of rewriting what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. I mean, the only thing that's bad about being wrong is being too stubborn to admit you're wrong, or too lazy to do something bad. You, you, you write it after your paper, you will sit down, you should read it over, and you get to the end, and um, you know, almost certainly your paper is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be the ultimate word that has ever been said on Greek archaeology, whatever it is. There's going to be all this stuff wrong with it. And almost certainly you will be able to see a lot of things that are wrong with it. Um, and the best thing you can do is then go back and do it again. The writer, you know, the experience of writing it will make you realize what you write so bad. Now you need to do it again, and then you do it again after that. Keep doing it, which because you can't do it ahead of this question, so you know, it's got to be in on Monday when you drop. But uh, insofar as you're able to do it, when you're able to do that, the better the work is, the crisper and clearer it is, 
Also, it's short of it. You can clear away the clutter, you realize it's how it just needs to be there. And so, in writing a book like this, it's just the same process, but magnified up on this much, much longer scale. And you may find this really hard to believe, but um, this book is substantially edited down from the earlier versions. The earlier versions were much more. <laughs> and much, much worse too. And so yeah, I, I, I stumbled into the argument. It takes me a long time to figure out what it is I'm talking about. But then most of it's in my hands. Is there a certain thing that inspired you to write this, or was it just kind of like a gradual accumulation of ideas and research? Yeah, I, I, a little bit of both, I really. think. Um, like, like a lot of academics, I felt for a long time that I, I want to write books that don't just get read by five specialists. You know, it's, Six on a good day, you know, four of whom I think are not really qualified to judge my work. Anyway. Um, you know, so, you know, a lot of us have been on this when we, we want to write for a bigger audience, but we, we kind of don't. So we think that what we're doing is important, and a measure of its importance is uh, its ability to change people's minds, but we can never really do that. You, you get into a rut, you, you know how to write academic books, um, you know, hopefully, you get to be critical about this, uh, you get rewarded for this, and people can jump out. So I've been thinking about these issues for sort of a long time, because I think if you're a classicist working in ancient Greece and Rome, questions of this kind are always lurking in your mind somewhere. So much of the importance of ancient Greece and Rome is based on this idea that they explain the subsequent history of the world. So you are always, you have always got this bubbling around the back of your mind. But so over the years, I've been thinking on and off about this. And I've been talking more and more in the early part of the last decade more and more with economists and political scientists and biologists and people with very different takes on it, to think a lot about it. But I probably never would have got around to writing it, except by the complete accident. And I, I would say that book is all about these vast impersonal forces. Accidents don't really matter. I think accidents are enormously important in our individual lives. And in my case, the accident was um, the wife of a, well, uh, a, a couple of very good friends of mine. One of my colleagues at Stanford, uh, Stanford Josh Ogre, the other Greek historian there, is uh, the guy, his wife, Adrian Mayo, has written a series of books about fossils. And she wrote this great book about ancient Greeks and fossils. The ancient Greeks had turned out, dug up all these fossils and dinosaurs, and made up all these stories about, uh, about what they were. And she wrote this book about these stories, and a lot of these have survived. Fantastic book. And this was aimed toward a general audience. And um, one day, uh, she had a literary agent to represent her, uh, because that, make, that basically makes it different. So he writes a, uh, a big audience book. The difference between whether it becomes a hit or not has very little to do with the author. It's all about the agent. Does the agent get your contract with the good press which promotes it properly? That's what makes all the difference. And so um, her agent said to her one day, well, do you know anybody else who might be interested in writing books that would be of interest to a general audience? And so she gave my name to her agent. The agent just phoned me up out of the blue and said, so what do you got? And this agent, and she's, uh, don't know if you watch Entourage, the HBO show. Yeah, so you know what Ari Gold, the agent of that, is like. Um, Sandy Dykes, the my literary agent, is like the literary version of Ari Gold. And she's like this force of nature, just terrifying woman. <laughs> I would not want to be an editor of the press when Sandy walks in through the door. But of course, I think you know, she, she represents a lot of very famous authors. Amy Tan is one of them, and she and lots and lots of very prominent novels are. So, of course, when she walks in the door, the editor's actually going to be a scientist. She might be about to make them a lot of money in you know, the written proposal. But so, um, what made me actually do it, as opposed to just talking about doing it, was half an hour on the phone with Sandy Dykes. It was like the lifeblood had been sucked out to me. It was a horrible <laughs> show. And it appeared there was no longer any discussion over whether I was going to be doing this or not. This had now been decided by Sandy Dykes. I was going to do this. And so, I mean, I. I mean, everybody's different, of course. With me, with me, I needed that kind of external shock to the system to sort of jolt me out of just writing another book about early new archaeology. I could very comfortably have gone on for another 30 years writing books which were basically more increasingly sophisticated versions of what I've already done. And it would have been a lot of fun, because, you know, being one of the world war authorities in the topic, it's a lot of fun. You, know, you get to sound up for hours at a time and stuff, it's great. Um, so it, it was difficult to make the jump into doing a very different sort of work. I'm really glad I did this. I think you know, this is one of the great things about being a professor is you can abruptly decide you're going to do something totally different than everything else you've done before, and they can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. You rarely hear this. 
I just, you know, I just want to realize, you rarely hear this kind of personal story about how this happens, but this jump of this book being written by a classicist as well. There is another. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, this is it. I mean, classics, it's this widely perceived to be this very dusty, dull, narrow, conservative field. Um, like, <laughs> when you're in a room with classics, maybe you'd be terrible. If you look back 150 years, this is, that is absolutely not what the field is about. 150 years of the 19th century. Um, the, the reason that classics becomes this huge field in universities is you've got all these guys, I mean, you go back far enough to get Edward Gibb, the decline of the Roman Empire. Or in the 19th century, George Brett, of this 12 uh, volume history of ancient Greece. But all these people are saying, Ancient Greece is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world. And uh, yeah, obviously this is not a, a theory I agree with, but I enormously admire this. This, this is our vision of how world history uh, developed. It's no, there's no point writing a book with only 12 specialists leading. You've got to write books that persuade large numbers of people, and particularly politicians, the people making and you know, financiers, the people who the real decision makers. These are the people you need to reach. And so, almost without exception, the great, I mean, not quite, but almost, and the great names in the 19th century classics were people who had enormous lay leadership. So, would sell tens of thousands of books in a time when the, the, the total leadership is dramatically smaller than it is now. And then, classics is kind of abandoned, moved away from it. I, I think you know, my take on it is that life got too comfortable for academic classics. So there was all these classics that worked around the country. Every little college, no matter how small the place is, has got a couple of people doing Greek and Latin. Um, the big universities have dozens of these people. Life gets to be too easy. Um, you, if you do you know, your narrow dissertation on uh, you know, bucolic imagery and Lucretius, or whatever, actually, that makes it a very uh, unworkable group on top. You know, one word in Lucretius is not good. Uh, you do your dissertation, um, you can't guarantee you're going to get hired into one of these jobs, but there's a pretty good chance. And uh, you can work on this very narrow stuff and get rewarded for it. And you don't have to worry too much about the rest of these things. Uh, which I think is this terrible shame. Because I mean, classicists are looking at all of these different things as a huge slice of history. Um, a slice of history that even something like me insists so strongly this was not the decisive moment in the history of the world. I still say it's one decisive moment in the history of the world. And if you had to pick a dozen historical topics and they say uh, the big things. I would say classical Mediterranean is one of them. But they're big because of the impact they have on the big story. And to, to understand that, you've got to look at the big picture and talk to a world audience. So yeah, I think it's terrible the way um, academia has become so in the term. That's one of the worst things I've ever done. Okay, can I just read that other one? I was just wondering, uh, did the experience of uh, working in this very, very different place in Washington have a wider impact on uh, your pedagogical approaches, and uh, do you foresee having a wider impact on all your future work? Gosh, yeah, that's a, a really good question. Yes, I mean, it, it has done. Right? With my teaching, uh, because it's not even working on this kind of topic, I suddenly decided, you know, a lot of the stuff I've been teaching in the past, I just don't think it's that important. I mean, I think it, it's stuff that should be done, but uh, do we need Stanford say we need each year to have four courses on ancient Greek history and one course on ancient Chinese history and basically nothing else on any of the ancient history of the rest of the world, with the exception, I guess, of the, uh, some of the New World specialists. Um, is that what you need? Is that really a good use of our resources? And, and obviously, it, it's not. Uh, and so I, I've been pushed to start teaching on much broader kinds of topics, which has been really, really fun to do. Right? And so with my writing, um, uh, again, yeah, everybody's different. Um, I know people who've written books that deal with very broad topics, and then their reaction to this has been that, oh my god, I never want to do that again. I don't want to go back to my specialty. And then I have had the opposite kind of thing. Right? And my experience has been that having done this book, um, it's hard now to see myself going back to spending large parts of the time working on really specialist topics. Which I'm not saying you know, that everybody should have done specialist topics. As if we do feel it's hollow down, it's going to be a of time. But uh, this kind of thing just fits my personality better than what I did before. Uh, I am not a deep person. And classics is for deep people who can go right to the bottom and deal with every nuance and detail and subtlety to get the very, very 
bottom of every problem. I don't have the attention span to do this. So it's always been a struggle for me. But this has been much better. Knowing a little bit about a lot of things, as opposed to the conventional model for classes, and knowing a huge amount of very small So yeah, I, I've gone over to the dark side now. There's just going to be more of this stuff. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Like, I was thinking about this when I was talking to my wife. Like, there, there's some people out there, I, I can't remember one of them, they won't buy the evolution stuff. But, however, you still have a lot of worthwhile things to say in the text that are very important, I think, that people need to really need to at least think about it and, and not outright reject it just because of face value and what they've seen in the book or are reviews from others. But I was wondering, what would you say to them? Say, hey, just give me a chance. What would you need to do to, to probably draw in a different part of the audience to say, hey, you need to at least think about this problem in the long term. Look at the patterns that I have laid out in history. There's, you've got good evidence to show that, even though it's broad, but yet it's the big picture. And it pre presents this big scheme to them. And I was wondering, like, like I think your work, Louis Barmesis, Frederick von Hayek, economist, and the way you meld economic history together with this lens and saying, hey, geography is a stimulus for action for the mm -hmm. people that to drive off of, what would you say to bring this crowd in? How would you try to bring these people in and say, hey, read this, please, please give me a chance? Yeah, I get it. My feeling about this is you know, if you've got a, a really strong opinion about the, the large shape of history, or I guess all about any topic, if you've got a really strong opinion about it, um, you kind of owe it to yourself to confront the people who have a, a completely different, really strong opinion. Um, and so, I mean, I always find that the most valuable thing for me tends to be reading the books that I disagree with most violently. Uh, well, I mean, that's what you were saying. I mean, think you can get to the point where you disagree so completely that you're just on different pages. There's no way you, you can have any kind of meaningful communication at all. So I guess it's reading the books and talking with the people who are interested in the same kinds of problems that I'm interested in, but come at them with totally different kind of angle. And so, um, in my teaching at Stanford, uh, for a long time I taught this course in the Ancient Empire, it's called the Iron Program, uh, which was this, it was a great fun course. It ran across two quarters. We looked at the history of ancient empires from um, the Assyrian Empire through to the fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, in the first quarter of it, which is the one I taught, we looked at two pairs of empires. First the Assyrian Empire and the Persian Empire. And in each case we looked at with the great empire itself and asked why are people doing the appearance and what makes it succeed. And I also looked at um, one of the smaller societies that gets kind of in the way of the empire, gets steamrolled or, or not by the empire. And so for the Persian Empire, because the obvious one to go against the Greeks because they left it to the material. For the Assyrian Empire, the obvious one is um, the Jews, because they are on the sea of the empire. So much of the Hebrew Bible is about the Assyrian Empire. And so um, at Stanford at that time, there were very few courses on ancient Israel being taught. And there were a lot of students who were very interested in it. So I got a lot of people in the class who uh, had a completely different attitude toward the Bible from my attitude, which for me, you know, this is a historical source. This is an incredibly valuable document compiled across the course of the first millennium BC. One of the most valuable sources we've got. For quite a few of the students we're teaching, um, it's that, but it's also, of course, a source of received wisdom about the world. And so uh, the different approaches we took to the Bible, these, these different pretty substantially. Yet we never once in the entire time had any kind of unpleasant episode of people getting angry or anything. Because it seemed to me that it's possible for us both to be right about this. I, mean, I don't think they're right. I think they're completely wrong. I mean, they're the people wrong. But it's possible you know, for me to use this document as a historical source and for their attitude toward the documents of religious sources to both be right. Um, you know, I can be right in the, the, the way that um, most of the philological scholars of the 19th century would say that you know, the Bible is compiled gradually across a long period of time, multiple authors contributing to it. Um, the old idea that you know, Moses wrote um, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, that if the philologist writes, um, then that idea is clearly not true. But that does, and there's clearly all these historical inaccuracies in the Hebrew Bible. But that doesn't necessarily impact its importance as a religious text. And so I, mean, I found that, that that teaching was very valuable, I thought, for people on both sides of this division. I think that on the whole, most of the students went away saying, yeah, yeah, you can use the Bible as a historical text, whatever your attitude, religious attitude is. And I came away feeling I'd learned an awful lot more about how religion ticks. 
Because I, I grew up in a very non-religious household, never a religious person, and I just, I don't get it. I don't understand how people can be religious. It's completely alien to me. But I found that teaching that stuff, using so much of the Hebrew Bible, I understood so much more about how religion worked because of it. And it was a tremendous experience for me, too. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I feel really strongly that the most valuable stuff you can do is read, read things and talk to people that you just don't agree with. And at the end of the day, uh, if both parties are reasonable, you're going to come away understanding a hell of a lot more than you I just want to say, we have basically five minutes for, for, for the standard course time, and this is going fantastic. I want to ask you, uh, would you be willing, there, you'll see there are lots of books in the room. Um, the students might like to have them signed. Oh, sure, I'd love to. Um, so, so, so we'll do that. <laughs> so don't put off. I've also, I've also, <laughs> I've, I've also put up the reading uh, already for next week. Um, just, just as an aside, the reading for next week is up. Um, it's, there's a digital copy on the wiki. I've also got a sign up sheet on the wiki. Just go in and sign for what you want, and then read that chapter. All right. Um, it's under the reading section. It's, it's the hidden wiki, not the one everybody can see. Um, so if you'll do that, that's fine. Remember, we're also not having class on Tuesday, so working projects, so it's next Thursday. Um, but we do have time for four minutes for one more uh, question. If anybody really has one, they want to ask. I'm going to ask mine, but if there's anyone else that... Anyone, anyone. Jenny? Um, okay, well, I guess since we were talking about how much those classics can be saying, where do you see it going overall? Yeah, I think, I think um, one direction I think that you probably will go is toward uh, linking it up more with this with ancient history that is past the world. Right? So, uh, like I say, I mean, one, one thing that is happening quite a lot in universities is people teaching courses on this idea of the axial age. And so you'll read Plato, but you also read some Confucius, and you'll read um, some early Buddhist literature, and you'll read them all together. Think about like, what are the differences, what are the similarities. Um, I, I, I obviously can't look at the stuff I do. I think this is a really good direction, really interesting direction. The cost, of course, is that if you're spending time reading computers, that's less time you, you devote to the reading world and stuff. So the cost is increasing superficiality, but the gain is increasing breadth. My guess is that the alternative to doing that is not going to be um, staying with the old style of classics. Lots and lots of intensive. Um, burying in the Greek and stuff. The alternative to the, the, the sort of more broader world classics, I mean, they could send more and more singing come by R or something. But the alternative is going to be the discipline just shrivelling up altogether. Because this is another big trend we're seeing all over the country is less and less pre modern stuff being taught. Like our history department at Stanford, fairly typical, has almost nobody working in our period before 1800. Hardly anybody before 1900. So that, I think, is the alternative. The ancient stuff just sort of disappears altogether. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, at Stanford, we, you know, we've changed the way we teach the field. Um, the number of classics majors has tripled over the last 10 years. So the graduate program has doubled in size. The faculty has grown by 50%. Our, um, our not that we're obsessed with money, but our gifts from outside have gone up by about 30%. That's its period. Life is gone. <laughs> and I think that's been driven largely by just saying, well, okay, a lot of students are really interested in this people and all this stuff, but what is it we need to do to teach it in ways that make it more interesting still, and ways that students think, this is actually something about religion. I think um, we've been really successful at doing this, but I think it's not rocket science either. It's usually obvious what we need to do to boost the environment, but people don't always want to do it. So again, I, I'm reasonably optimistic about classics. Uh, but um, I don't think it's going to carry on in the form that it's currently been there. Just like if it's constantly changed throughout history, that's going to carry on. Well, I think we need to thank Professor Morris for actually giving classics a major injection of energy with this book because, you know, if you actually have a theorem named after you, and well, you, you, it's not the same you have to name it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to put that in there. The change is caused by lazy, greedy, and frighten people looking for easier, more profitable, safer ways to do things, and they rarely know what they're doing unless they know their history, right? Thank you.